Hello and welcome back to Classic Looks with Stara. Lily has decided that Dana's was a presence. She insisted. And as usual, I'd like to remind you to please stay safe and healthy and hit that like button, subscribe, comment below, and hit the notification bell. And today we are going to get back into Rudy Rucker's Infinity in the Mind. We are on chapter two. All the numbers is the first part of that chapter. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alrighty then. In this chapter, we will begin by tracing the development of the familiar real number system with its infinity of irrational numbers. Once on, once one has accepted rational numbers, there's really no reason not to accept infinitely, infinitely large or transfinite, transfinite numbers. So the second section of the uh, chapter will be devoted to the transfinite ordinals and cardinals. The ordinals form a gappy number sequence, somewhat like the natural numbers. It is a natural move to fill in these gaps as densely as possible. Just as one fills in the space between, for instance, two and three with rational and real numbers. If we fill in as much as possible, we end up with what might be called an absolutely continuous ordering. In the section on infinitesimals and surreal numbers, I'll present some examples of such offerings, any one of which can be viewed as comprising all the numbers, including the infinitesimals. In the final section of this chapter, I will return once again to the section of whether the infinitely big and infinitely small numbers have any real existence, physically or otherwise. From Pythagoranism to Cantorism, Pythagoras lived in Greece and Italy in the 6th century BC. He is an extremely shadowy and ambivalent figure. On the one hand, he was a wizard, the shamanistic leader of a religious sect. And in fact, I'm thinking of getting a book on him and reading because he seems pretty interesting. On the other, he has frequently been credited with bringing about the birth of modern mathematics and mathematical figure physics. The sect of Pythagorean, the, the Pythagoreans is best known for their belief in metamysychosis or reincarnation, which is another story, and I think it's, of course, there's no proof, but uh, I do believe it's a fair possibility because energy survives after death so and you know each spring the earth comes back to life that's just it's, it's a form of reincarnation when I, when when flowers come back etc etc so that being said when the physical form human form dies why not have it come back into another form and I don't know what form like I said, it's going to come back as a cat or not, but <laughs> that's funny. We don't know what it comes back back on. I'm guessing maybe sometimes we come back as humans or whatever. Or maybe, like I said, this is all nothing that can be proven because it's not physical in the, in the physical sense. I mean, if you can't see it, a lot of people don't believe it. But um, maybe even in another part of the universe or parallel universe, etc., 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 so anyways, back to where I'm going. They believe that there is one cosmic mind or soul, that you are alive because a small piece of this soul is imprisoned in your body, and that the bit of soul that animates you, you will animate many other bodies before, yes, your soul, energy, whatever, before returning to full unity with the one big soul. The Pythagoreans adhered to a great number of rules and taboos, never looked back when crossing a border, always put the right shoot on first. I guess I never heard that one. Never pick up food that drops from the table. I wouldn't do it just because it might get sick. Apparently in an effort to bring themselves into a closer harmony with the cosmos. Presumably it was hoped that if in the course of your lifetime you could bring yourself into a close enough relationship with the one, then with it, when your body died, the soul that vivified it might be able to turn to the source instead of being forced into another body. That's what we all strive for. I think that's, 
yeah. I think there are different religions. I'm not, I'm not familiar with all of them, but that believe that, you know, that each of our lifetimes are, we are supposed to toward, be towards progressing towards, to, to the eventuality of getting, not being forced back to the body, but to the one. That's what. Pythagoras was said to be able to remember several of his previous lives, and, it, and maybe he's here today. And he was believed to have many other supernatural powers as well. There was a whole series of ancient miracle tales about Pythagoras, such as stories. He was once, he was once seen in widely separated places at the same time, and that one, once when he was crossing a river, it hailed him in an audible voice saying, Greetings, Pythagoras. Part and parcel of the Pythagorean religious beliefs were a number of numerological notions. There was a feeling that the essential nature of the cosmos was somehow numerical, with certain numbers seem, seeming to embody particular abstract concepts. The Pythagoreans made the following identifications. Uh, one was mind, the one. Two was opinion, the first moving away from unity. Three represented wholeness, beginning, middle, and end. Four was justice, a square deal. Five stood for marriage, since five equals two plus three, and even numbers were regarded as a fem as female, odd as male. And my life number seven, but I'm a female. Under a later system, the numbers one, one through four were identified with the point line, plain, and solid, respectfully. The number 10 was singled out with special attention, was said to symbolize perfection. Oh, it's funny, I just was watching a movie and someone said that, that 10 was a, per, was a good number. Now I know it's, they were right. One reason for this is, this is obvious. People have 10 fingers and most of our systems of numerations are based on the number 10. But a more important reason for the importance of the number 10 is that 10 equals one plus two plus three, plus four, and the numbers one through four and their interrelations were regarded as primary. The fact about ten was represented by the Pythagorean Tetractus depicted in figure 36. I'll show you. That's in the next page. Yeah, a few pages there. That's, that's that page there. Yeah, okay. okay. A Pythagorean would feel right at home in a bowling alley, ritually building and destroying the tetractus with a sphere punctuated by a triad of holes and recording his progress with a series of numbers inscribed in squares. And this figure's 33 and 34. I don't know. On here. The Pythagorean, Pythagoreans assumed that since 10 was so important, there should be 10 heavenly bodies at the time, there were only nine known celestial objects, not counting the stars, so the Pythagoreans postulated the existence of a counter-Earth that is never seen. Because it is always on the opposite side of the sun, it is interesting to realize that this type of argument is the stock and trade of modern mathematical physics. For example, a three-dimensional chart of all the known elementary particles is drawn up. The chart looks, let us say, like a regular dodecahedron with one corner missing. It would look pretty and more symmetric if there was an, an additional particle with such and such characteristics to fill the missing corners. So the physicists postulate the existence of such a particle. The surprising thing is that often as not, such an argument turns out to be a correct, a particle with ex Exactly the predicted properties is discovered. The fact is that a priori mathematical considerations can lead to import empirically determined physical truths. The structure of the physical universe is deeply related to the structure of the mathematical universe. The Pythagoreans were aware of examples of this relationship, having observed, for instance, that at the lengths of two stretched strings are in a, sim in a simple numerical ratio, such as 2, 1, or 3, 2, <coughs> or 4, 1. Then the notes produ uh, produced by plucking the strings are cons consonant. The conclusion that the Pythagoreans drew was, according to Aristotle, that the elements of numbers are the elements of things. 
and that the whole heaven is a harmony and a number. Again, Aristotle states that the Pythagoreans considered numbers the substance of all things. This sort of viewpoint is not un congenial to modern, the modern scientists for whom any phenomenon can be expressed in terms of numbers, vectors, functions, operators, groups, and the like. If one believes that the universe is basically all form and no content, and that the forms that arise in nature all admit of mathematical representation, then one can re reasonably conclude that anything that exists is ultimately a mathematical object. Take my right shoe, for example. I can, of course, state the size, count the number of eyelets, or determine the weight in grams, but even independently of my efforts, the shape exists mathematically as the set of coordinates a pointing that happen to lie within the substance of the shoe, and the color of the shoe is precisely specified by a function given the wave lengths of light reflected at each point of the surface of the shoe. As for the actual particles that make up the shoe, they may very well be nothing more than small irregularities in the curvature of space-time. So it's not really so odd to believe with the Pythagoreans that ultimately reality is precisely mathematical form. Okay, um, okay it shows a little thing here. Limited, one, rest, straight, good, unlimited, many, motion, crooked, bad. So far, so good, but the story gets more interesting. The Pythagoreans did not believe in infinite forms. They are credited with the creation of a table of opposites, which I have partially re reprinted. Looking at this table, it is evident that the Pythagoreans would not have been big fans of infinity. In the original Greek, they have aperon for unlimited. Now, if one, everything is a mathematical form, and two, nothing in infinite exists, then everything is basically either a natural number as some relationship between a few natural numbers. Note that you have to give up either if it can be pro proved that there was some feature of the world that cannot, even in principle, be fully represented by a finite number of natural numbers. Imagine the coast of southern Italy. You are out on the water, brilliant ultramarine water in dry, rugged rocks. Pythagoras himself was aboard the boat in this outing. Of the Brotherhood. There's been a lot of hassles with the locals, and everything is finally mellow, kind of merged out here on the water. Pythagoras sitting, sitting on the deck, talking with Hippasus, a guy in his 30s who laughs a lot. Hippasus is scratching lines on the smooth deck with a knife, showing Pythagoras some of the others a construction he's been fooling with. It goes something like this. That's figure 35. A little woman here. Once a square and the diagonal of the square have been drawn, one can ask about the ratio ds or the length of the diagonal to the length of the side. If all things are expressible in the terms of natural numbers, then one would expect that there are two natural numbers, m and n, such as such that ds mm. But it can be conclusively proved that no such natural numbers m and n exist. The ratio ds, the irrational nameless aperon. In the mental movie we were just watching, Hippasus is letting Pythagoras in on this. One version of the movie's ending is when the Pythagoras, Pythagoreans returned from their sail. It turned out that Hippasus had drowned at sea. Given the Pythagorean theorem, the, the theorem which states that the square of the Hipp hypotenuse of a right triangle a triangle is equal to the sum of the squares of the sides. We can see that. No, no, I'm going to show you. I'll show you the show you a little thing right there. So I don't read calculus. D2 equals S2 plus S2. So D2 equals 2S2. So D2 forward slash S2 equals 2. So the ratio D forward slash S equals 2 in modern terms. What the Pythagoreans learned was that 2 is an irrational number, but as far as they were concerned, they had discovered that there was a physical relationship. The ratio DS, which was not <clears throat> reprehensible in terms of numbers, since they did not recognize the existence of ratios other than 
that the natural number natural number ratios the ratio ds was called allegos meaning inexpressible it was also called erratos meaning not having a ratio it is interesting to see how one might go about trying to find the representation of v2 as a fraction or ratio of national natural numbers this amounts to the problem of finding an n such as that <coughs> some m n2 n2 equals 2 n2 n2 in the table below i've sketched the beginning of a search for such an n i'll show it to you in a second the curious thing is that we can say with certainty that this search must remain forever fruitless the proof is covered in almost every survey course of mathematics and it says on the blow continue forever with all fractions equal to two in this column it's a little bit of a fun probably showed it to you earlier too show it again and you can see that other side there we go for the greeks there were two kinds of magnitudes discrete and continuous discrete magnitudes could be counted set into correspondence with natural numbers that were sometimes visually visualized as patterns of dots but continuous magnitudes simply did not correspond to any number at all just as we can add and multiply numbers we can ma manipulate continuous magnitudes by means of the techniques called geometrical algebra the greeks developed these techniques to the point where they could in effect solve most quadratic equations involving continuous magnitudes Consider, for example, the geometric technique of finding the mean proportional between two lengths, A and B. That is given line segments A and B. We wish to find a line segment M such that A, M, M, B. The construction of M is as follows. Put a B, put A and B end to end forming AC. Construct a semicircle having AC as di diameter. Erect the perpendicular to AC at AB, meaning the semicircle at D. Let AD have length M, AM, MB, because triangle ABD is similar to triangle DBC. I'll show it to you again. There you go. Let's see how far we're going today. Okay. And here's figure 38. I'll show you that as well. These two ahead as well. Alrighty. Okay. In modern terms, as we would say that M is a solution of the equation A forward slash X equals X forward slash B, A, B equals X2 or X equals A, B. The fact that we can solve the second to last equation is expressed geometrically in Proposition 14 of Book 2 of Euclid's Elements, which say in parts, that it is possible to construct a square equal in area to any given rectangle. Notice how differently the problem of finding the mean proportion, proportional is treated today since one we <coughs> think of there being a real number corresponding to every length and since two we have extended all of the usual operations such as multiplications and square roots to the real numbers we are able to assert that one any given line, line segments of some real number length as length length a and b and that two there's a real number m equals a b what are these protein real numbers of ours in general a non-negative real number like the form n r one r two r three r four r five where n is a natural number, and each of the r is one of the digits 0 through 9. The interesting thing about these real numbers is that they are, in point of fact, very ideal objects. The string of digits to the right of the decimal place is infinite. Strictly speaking, a real number can never be completely written out. Of course, some real numbers, such as 25,000 or 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3 eventually began began repeating themselves for convenience we write these numbers as follows 25.0 and 3.123 where it is understood that the string of digits under the bar is repeated over and over there is an interesting little theorem about uh, repeating decimals to state this theorem we must keep in mind that a 
real number is rational if it is equal to some fraction such as 7 eighteenths. Theorem. A real number R is rational if and only if it has a repeating decimal expansion. I'll show you that again. Instead of giving a formal proof of the theorem, let's just see an example of how each direction works. First, imagine that you have a real number R that is equal to the fraction 2 sevenths. In order to get the decimal expansion of R, we begin dividing 7 into 2. I have circled the ex successive remainders that occur. Notice that, one, when you are dividing by 7, the remainder is always one of the natural numbers, 0 through 6, and 2. If the same remainder occurs twice, then the decimal starts repeating since the same sequence of actions will follow. Second, imagine that there is a real number, R, that has a repeating decimal expansion, 1, 2, 3. Now, R has an infinite number of blocks of 1, 2, 3 to the right of the decimal, so if we move one of these blocks to the left of decimal by taking 1,000 R, then there will be still there will still be an infinite number of 1, 2, 3 blocks to the right of the decimal. And this was a little thing there. I'll show you both of them. So, in the indicated calculation, if we subtract R from 1,000 R, then there is nothing remaining on the right of the decimal. It is satisfying to see that the two finite ways of describing a real number as a fraction or as a repeating decimal co coincide. Given that we have proved that V2 is irrational, we can be sure that the decimal expansion of V2 never repeats. That is when we write V2 equals 1.4159. We do not have any simple way of describing the pattern that the dot 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 stands for. We can also, oh great, <laughs> we can also use the theorem in the reverse way. That is, we can artificially construct a repeating, non-repeating decimal and be sure that this represents an irrational real number. There is, for instance, the artificial number of Leoville, and a whole bunch of numbers there that shows, <laughs> where the building principle of steadily increasing the number of zeros between the ones guarantee that the number never never repeats itself. A different sort of non-repeating number, repeating decimal, can be obtained by sticking together all the natural numbers to get the number number. And it shows like a more numbers right there. Or the line, figure 39. But how can we be sure that such artificial decimal expansions are really numbers? What exactly is meant by dot point one two three four five. The understanding is that point one two three four five stands for the infinite infinite series or sum one tenth plus two one hundredths plus three one thousandths plus four one thousandths plus five one thousandths plus dot 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 dot. It is easy to visualize a geometric interpretation. One is tempted just to say that a given real number such as dot one two th point one two three four five is really to be thought of as a point on the idealized real number line. The problem with this approach is that one does not really explain that the real number line comes from the real number line comes from. The real number line is basically something to be found was certainly only in the mindscape. There's no reason to assume in advance that our physical space is filled with copies of the real number line. The problem was finally dealt with only about one hundred years ago by our old friends Cantor and Dedekind. Cantor basically defined a real number simply as an infinite sequence of digits. Just as was done above, the original element of this approach of his approach was that one does not act as if the limit or sum of the infinite series expressed by a real number is anything other than or, an ex or external to the series itself. Thus, the sum of the series two tenths plus five one thousandths, plus seven one thousandths, plus nine one thousandths, plus. By using various weird definitions, one can learn to add and multiply such series with each other without having to pretend that no one, that one is really working with finitely given limits. The point is that Cantor gave up the pretense that the real numbers are primarily finite lengths. The treated that he treated them rather as arbitrary infinite series of the form 
positive n, n dot r1, r2, r3, r4. And that's that line again. Dedekind also defined real numbers in terms of infinite sets. His approach was to characterize a number as a cut, LR, of the rational series. The idea is that every rational is either an L or an R, and every member of L is less than every member of R. For instance, the square root of 2 would be represented by the cut A, B, A2, B2, 2, A, B, A2, B2. The crucial thing about Dedekind's definition of real number is that, again, the real number itself was an infinite set. To be more precise, a Dedekind real number is a pair, LR, of infinite sets. It is a curious fact in the history of mathematics that Dedekind's definition of real numbers is taken over almost unaltered from the Eudoxian theory of proportion given in Useless Elements, Book 5. The problem Eudoxus had been concerned with was how we can compare and manipulate ratios such as the DS ratio mentioned above that are not equal to the ratio of any two national numbers. Natural numbers. His solution, solution was essentially to... Re Regarding a rational ratio, x, y is a cut of the form m, n, m, y, and x. m, n, m, y, and x. One can see that this makes sense if one realizes that m, n, x, y, if m, y, x, n, x, and likewise 4. The difference between what Eudoxus and Dedekind did in the Eudoxus thought of the ratio between two magnitudes as the fundamental thing with a description in terms of infinite sets arising only in a practical and potentially infinite way, since one would not in practice ever need all the members of each side of the cut. Unless someone has con had constructed two specific magnitudes to be compared, the equivalent cut had no meaning, as it was an infinite and thus unreal thing. Dedekind, on the other hand, accepted the actual infinite sets of the cut as a fundamental, whether or not one has a particular trick for some or some, for some constructing a strength that length that drops a point down into the into the cut's gap is immaterial. All the different actually infinite cut sets exist in the mindscape, and all in the real numbers are already there, whether or not they can be finitely named or constructed. The point is that the only way to get a stable mathematical representation of the notion arbitrary real number is to represent real numbers by actually infinite sets. There's no other way to get an absolute foundation of the real number system interior of discrete mathematical obje objects. Once it was realized that real numbers can be represented in, represented in terms of infinite sets, the dam broke. Ten years after Cantor's death, it was already a commonplace that every mathematical object can be represented by a set. If you have ever picked up a mathematics test in any field, be it analysis, algebra, or topology, you will have noticed that the book begins with a short chapter or section on set theory. This is because everything the book mentions can be represented as a set. For the Pythagoreans, everything was a natural number. Their belief be became untenable when it was realized that certain things are in their in most essence, infinite. The modern mathematical credo called Cantorism asserts that everything, at least everything mathematical, is a set. Just as the existence of the actual infinite forces a revision of the Pythagorean position, the existence of the absolute infinite forces a revision of the Cantorian position. <clears throat> If there are indeed absolutes of the kind discussed in the earlier section on the theorists, I mean on the absolute infinite, then there are things that are not sets. Set theorists are still not quite certain what to do about this, but let us not worry about absolute infinity before discussing the transfinite. Once we realize that the rational numbers are fundamentally infinite and that they can be fully grounded only on a theory of infinite sets, then it is natural to start looking at infinitely large or transfinite numbers. In Cantor's words, one can without qualification say that the transfinite numbers stand or fall with the infinite rationals. Their inmost essence is the same, for these are definitely laid out 
instances or modifications of the actual infinite. A last remark on Cantorism, just as chemistry was unified and simplified when it was realized that every chemical or compound is made of atoms, mathematics was dramatically unified when it was realized that every object in mathematics can be taken to the same kind of thing, to be the same kind of thing. There are now other ways than set theory to unify mathematics. But before set theory, there was no such unifying concept. Indeed, in the Renaissance, mathematicians hesitated to add x2 to x3, since the one was an area and the other a volume. Since the advent of set theory, one can correctly say that all mathematicians are exploring the same mental universe. And I'm going to stop right there today. And the next uh, one will be transfinite numbers. But if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, hit the notification bell. And as always, stay safe and healthy. And be sure... Oh, sorry, I'm a little hot right now. <laughs> stay tuned for the next installment of Infinity in the Mind by Rudy Rutger by Astara and Lily. Have a good day. Stay cool, too.